Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Good. I, I'm. Um. I hope and I'm speaking. Well, I'm speaking through the microphone, so hopefully the sound is a lot better. Okay. Good. Because I decided to speak through the microphone. So we're just gonna sit here and just talk to one another until. Till about I don't know maybe eight oh five. Eight ten. And see who comes into the room. Let's see who else is in here. Say hi. Good. So how you doing tonight? You good? It's been a long day. I went to a protest. I had lunch. I had several beers. And I got something Italian here. That's good. That's good. I'm I'm good. I mean, I'm a little bit tired. You know, I went to I went to another protest today. Unfortunately, um, it didn't have anything to do with the protest, but uh, apparently, a lady got killed. Yeah. Man, what's up, Lance? What's happening? What's going on with you? Long time no see. Yeah, uh, apparently a young lady lost her life. She was shot. Yeah, she got she got she got shot and um it was right outside the park. I mean, I didn't hear anything but the people that I was with heard something and the police started coming from everywhere. And um yeah, it was it was not not good. So, I went to go and pick up a new bike. I did that today. Yeah, that is most unfortunate. I went to pick up a bike today. And uh so I got a new bike sitting in the living room. But it's it's cool. Now I can get around a lot better. So that's good. So, we'll get started probably in the next like three minutes. And uh, we'll get into it. Oh, hey. You know, thank you. Um, I think, I think for me, just being out there, I always wanted to know what it was like in the 1960s. And I got to feel a little bit of what it was like in the 60s and I, I just I just appreciate the moment and I appreciate being able to be out there and feeling the energy and you know and, and to try to bring about some change cuz it just can't continue to go on the way it's been going on. It has to change. And um I think people are ready for some change. They're ready for things to be done differently. And uh, I didn't get to, to hear the city council meeting. We were supposed to go into the city council meeting. But, um, you know, like I said, I just got home probably about 45 minutes ago. And I've just been trying to get my notes together for the show tonight. And so I'll be able to, like, sit down and review what all happened at the city council meeting. But anyway, um, I think we'll just get started. If you hear in the background, I got some mood music. It's Louis Prima playing right now and um i'm not sure i like the name of the playlist it's called the mafia playlist i don't know what that's all about that's exactly right 
Miss Rose, that's exactly right. The world is ready for change. And it's got to happen sooner rather than later. So, hey, Reese. So, this lady right here, Miss Johansson, I call her peanut butter. Reese, peanut butter, yeah. Yeah, man, she was one of the one of the people who always support me. Rose, definitely, I can definitely put you in that in that category. I appreciate y'all, you know, turning me on uh, to listen to this little talk. So we're gonna get into it, and um, you know, as things come to mind or whatever, I might digress a little bit, but I'll try to keep this. To a certain amount of time. Because I know y'all got other things to do. Like Netflix binging and shit like that. So anyway. We're going to begin with. Well we're going to. Let, let's go back to. The 1890s. And of course. A lot of things are happening at that time. You know. Uh, the Democrats. In, or, so, or the so called Redeemers have regained power in the Louisiana legislature and in New Orleans city government. Um, And we have a lot of Italian immigrants showing up. And um, these Italian immigrants, as all immigration waves go, they were blamed for a lot of crime and they were um, discriminated against. And the Italians were no different. Um, They had several... Hey, Lucinda, how you doing? There was a lot of um, derogatory things said about Italians at that time. Um, Most of the people who came were good people. um, But if you invite a whole bunch of people into anything, it could be a party, it could be anything. Hey, baby doll. Um, If you invite a whole bunch of people to anything... Unfortunately, you're going to have some people who come for the wrong reasons. And unfortunately, that's what happened uh, in the 1890s, or rather the 1870s. The Matranga brothers, Carlo, which they called him Charles. He anglicized his name. Charles and Antonio Matranga. And they came to New Orleans in the 1870s. And most people open up produce stands. Most people from Italy, they they open up produce stands. Some got into dairy. But these gentlemen got into... Let me clean a little lint out of my beard. Oh, my God. It's a commitment having a beard. But these guys opened up a saloon and a brothel. So they decided to open up a business that, you know... What's up? They decided to open up a business that people could use. But unfortunately, soon it grew into extortion and labor racketeering. So for the most part, they they victimized Italian dock workers, the people who loaded and offloaded bananas. And then they muscled in on the established family, the Provenzanos. And they had a monopoly on other fruit and produce. So they clashed. But they crawl or they 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 had a little truce, right? We'll do business together. Of course that didn't last. That lasted a couple of years and eventually it broke out into all out war. It broke out into gang wars. And each side they were bringing in heavy hitters from From Sicily. Hey sis. They brought in. uh, Heavy hitters from from Sicily. And. The the weapon of choice. Was a sawed off shotgun. And. You know it began to be. Almost like the trademark of the New Orleans Mafia. They, They used sawed off shotguns. Which left a. Pretty big ass hole in you. If you got, if you were unlucky enough to get shot by one, love you too, sweetheart. What's up, Joe? What's happening? Thank you to all the people that just came into the room. Um. 
so like I said, eventually, the, I'm glad you made it. Glad to have you here. So, going back, just, just to backtrack a little bit. The New Orleans Mafia pretty much started in the 1870s. Nothing much, bro. I'm just, just you know, trying to trying to spit this history out, you know. Um, the New Orleans Mafia started with the Matranga brothers in the 19 in the 1870s. They opened up a salon, uh, a saloon rather, and a brothel. Then it grew into extortion and labor rackets. Then they muscled in on the fruit monopoly, and they victimized Italian dock workers. Okay? And then they called the truce with the Provenzano family, who, who were the established group, but they were like a loose group of criminals. And they clashed over grocery and produce rackets. So who knew a battle over zucchini and bananas could get violent? Apparently, you know, they took that shit very seriously back in those days. So, like I said, each family brought in mafioso from Sicily. And bodies started to hit the floor. Blood started to run in the streets. And Mayor Shakespeare, Joseph uh, Shakespeare, no relation to William, um, put pressure on the police chief. His name was David C. Hennessy. Hennessy would be good right now. But I have Italian... Yeah, something Italian. Anyway, so he put pressure on the police chief, David Hennessy. And he had instructions. He wanted the mob war to end. So Chief Hennessy started to investigate both families. And he put a lot of the Provenzano family in jail. And he put a lot of the Matrangas in jail. But when he did that, just kind of put a target on his back. So on October 15th, 1890, he was shotgunned on a city street. When they asked him who did it, when they asked him who did it, he replied it was the Dagos. Now I apologize to anybody of Italian descent, but this was a derogatory name that they labeled Italians with. Um, he replied it was the Italians. I won't use the word again. And when he did that, when word got out, the backlash was swift. Because you have to remember, Sicilians and Italians were looked upon to be as low as black folks. Yeah. So, <laughs> I know, right? So basically, they went out and they rounded up any Italian they could find, which in the French Quarter at that time, that was like an enclave of Italian people. So they probably arrested maybe 300 people. Most of them were released because there was no evidence against them. But somehow they found 19 people. And these people were tried for the murder of Chief Hennessy. And some of them were acquitted and some of them, some of the trials resulted in hung juries. Good to be hung. Well, at least in that way. <clears throat> Did I say that? Sorry. So, um, the people, the good white peoples of the city believe that there was jury tampering. And, you know, to be honest with you, and maybe there was a little jury tampering, you know, just a little bit. But public outrage started to grow. And you know what happened next? Well, on March 14th, 1891, a lynch mob consisting of New Orleans' most prominent citizens went to the old parish prison and lynched those boys. Lynched almost all of them. Nine, or what, 11 out of 19 they lynched. Now, like I said, this was this lynch mob was made up of the most prominent citizens in New Orleans. I mean, the white tablecloth crowd. Now, who knew that the white tablecloth crowd could find a way to repurpose white tablecloths as sheets and hoods? That's ingenuity. 
<clears throat> but I digress. Anyway, this event had national implications. The Italian consulate uh, lies a formal pro uh, protest with the U.S. government, and tensions began to rise. Hey, Diane. Tensions began to rise between the United States and Italy. Italy actually broke off diplomatic relations with the United States. There was talk of war between the United States and Italy over an incident that happened right here in New Orleans. Well, right over there in New Orleans. I'm at Metri. Delicious. So, this was the first time. Now, here's a little history. This was the first time that the word mafia entered the American lexicon. Did you hear that word? What word did I say? Mafia. Yeah, this was the first time that word hit the American lexicon. This was also a time, again, of massive Italian immigration. And unfortunately, law-abiding citizens were painted with the brush of mafia. Mafia. That, there you go. Okay, you got me. Yeah, well, they were unfortunately associated with organized crime. And it's actually something that persists to this day. So, it all stemmed from this incident. But you might ask, what happened to Matranga? What happened to Charles Matranga? Well, he was able to haul ass out of town. He was able to escape the, the lynch mob, and he hauled ass out of town. He stayed out of town for a little while, and then when he came back, he was the head of the criminal organization. You can't really call him a family. It was more of a black hand, loose confederation of criminals, kind of like the Legion of Doom of criminals. So he actually ran the local mob until the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties. And then he was succeeded by Silver Dollar Sam Carolla. Now, Matranga lived to be an old man. He died in New Orleans. Excuse me. He gave up. He gave up power to Sam Carolla. And let's talk about Sam Carolla for, for, for a minute or two. Now, Sam Carolla came to the U.S. in 1904. And by 1918, he had moved up in Matranga's family. By 1922, he was the boss. I was there for up with mobility. So, Carolla gained a lot of influence with politicians where Matranga did not have the influence that, that Carolla had. And um, that gave him a lot of cover during Prohibition. Carolla ran the mob during the Prohibition days, and he sold liquor. Hey, Claire. He sold liquor to, uh, they produced liquor here, and they sold it to different outfits around the country, like the Chicago mob, who uh, actually tried to strong arm Sam Carolla. And one day there was an incident at the, at the airport and it was a fight between Al Capone's people and Sam Carolla's people. Sam Carolla's people consisted of New Orleans police officers. So, at the end of the day, Al Capone didn't get what he wanted, and Carolla was able to sell liquor to whatever outfit he wanted to sell to. So, by the end of Prohibition, mob legend Frank Costello, Sam Carolla, and Governor Huey Long entered into an agreement to bring slot machines into Louisiana, particularly New Orleans. At one time, there were slot machines all over the fucking place. Oh, by the way, Huey Long uh, is the subject of the first two episodes of the 5 O'Clock History podcast, which you can find on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podcast Monster, and any other place where you can get your podcast. Make sure you check that out. Huey Long. Anyway, Carolla was uh, deported several times, but he always managed to bring his ass back into the country. You just couldn't keep his ass out. So, Carolla was deported, and he came back several times. The last time he came back was in 1970, and that was 
to broker an agreement with the new mob boss, which I'll tell you about in a second, but he was kind of like an elder statesman by that time. And unlike many mobsters, he died a free man in New Orleans in 1972. Most mobsters either die in prison or they die on the street. So it's very, very rare um, that they would die a free man. But Matranga died a free man and now Corolla. Kind of a theme. Let's talk about the successor to Silver Dollar. The one that's most famous. Carlos Marcello. The godfather of crime in New Orleans. So in 1947, around the time Corolla was first deported, he turned over power to his first lieutenant, Carlos Marcello. And Marcello, again, was the most notorious gangster in Louisiana history and possibly one of the most notorious gangsters in U.S. history. And I'll tell you why that is in a second. Oh, by the way, for, y'all, for those of you who thought Edwin Edwards was the most notorious gangster in Louisiana history, no, it was Marcello. But anyway. So... So Carlos Marcello came to this country. He was an immigrant from Tunisia. His parents were Sicilian. And um, he came in about 1911. And he moved up the ranks uh, in crime. And he was a very, very um, tough individual. He lived in Gretna. Um, He ended up living in Metairie. Uh, That's right, Metairie, Karenistan. And uh, the Kefauver Committee in the 1950s, which was formed to investigate organized crime, called him one of the worst criminals in the country. He lived right here in the New Orleans area. Robert F. Kennedy, who was the Attorney General in 1961 in the Justice Department, deported Carlos Marcello uh, to Guatemala because, you know, I. To this day, I don't know why they sent him to Guatemala. They probably sent him to the place where he didn't want to go. But they sent him to Guatemala in 1961. But he was back within a few days. He just said, okay, drop me off in Guatemala. I'll be back. And he just doubled the fuck back. And he ended up back in the United States. And he was able to use his considerable power and money to fight off deportation. And Marcello beat a lot of charges. You know, a lot of people talk about John Gotti and they call him the Teflon Don. But Carlos Marcello, it's like Claire said, was a bad motherfucker. He had the best lawyers that money could buy. And so he was able to beat a lot of charges until he got old. Oh, by the way, not only did he beat charges, it's alleged, well, he was convicted of beating an FBI agent. Yeah, they got beatings too. So he was convicted after, uh, after in the second trial because in the first trial, it was a hung jury. Again, it's good to be hung. So he was sentenced to two years in prison. Think about that. Two years in prison for whipping the ass of an FBI agent. That's power. He, ser- he was to serve two years, and he got off in six months. A federal charge. Think about it. Anyway, he got out and he spent time running his criminal empire until something else came on down the pipe. In 1981, Marcello, Charles Roma, the former governor's daddy, and two other men were charged with a bunch of shit. Conspiracy, racketeering, mail, and wire fraud. Don't forget wire fraud. Right up there with stealing the cable. I know some of y'all out there stealing cable still. In a scheme to get millions of insurance contracts. Because in Louisiana, insurance contracts are very lucrative. Hey, August. Hey, Herm. Thanks for joining us. Now, this was called the Brylab trial, and this was big news back in the early 80s. 
You couldn't turn on the news without hearing about Bri Lab. I was a kid. What the fuck did I know about it? I read. It's a dangerous thing. But anyway, Marcelo and Roma, out of the 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 out of the crew. What's up, Justin? Marcelo and Roma were the only two people convicted in the Bri Lab case. And Marcelo went to prison. This was the first time that the federal government had ever been able to make anything stick against Carlos Marcelo. He continued to run the family from within prison. Drugs, prostitution, gambling, not so much. Slot machines and the numbers had pretty much went out of the window by the early 80s. But in a stroke of luck, for a man who should have been used to strokes of luck, the Brylab case was thrown out in 1989. And the old Don came home. That's right. He came home. He lived in his Metairie mansion for the last 10 years of his life. And he died in 1993. And along with his death, some people would argue that it was the death of the mafia influence in New Orleans. Eh, It's debatable, but when he was alive, the mafia definitely controlled labor, gambling, maybe even construction. And the Marcello family still owns a lot of land in the New Orleans area. You can't go 10 feet without... What's up, Allison? What's up, Twyla? You can't go 10 feet without somebody telling you a Carlos Marcelo story if they're over the age of, let's say, 55. He was a legend. But, let me give you one more story about Marcelo. Many of you who are JFK assassination conspiracy buffs have heard the name Carlos Marcelo before. In 1978, the House Select Committee on Assassinations attempted to find a connection between Carlos Marcelo and the JFK assassination. For the most part, they found that Marcelo had the motive, the means, and I guess the opportunity to have the president murdered. But no concrete evidence truly exists of any connection between the Marcello crime family and Lee Hart. Many people believe, many people on the street, I'm back, okay, sorry about that. Many people believe on the streets that Carlos Marcello had something to do with the JFK assassination. Why? Hey, Giselle. Because it all goes back to 1961 when Marcello was deported. He blamed Robert Kennedy. And the reasoning was, in order to get back at Robert Kennedy and get him out of the Attorney General's office, they would have to kill the president. Because if JFK wasn't the president anymore, the new president would surely choose another Attorney General. Makes sense, but again, no concrete evidence exists that Carlos Marcello had anything to do with the JFK assassination. So that's the story of the New Orleans Mafia in a nutshell. So now I'm just going to open it up for Q&A. If anybody has any questions, you can shoot them over to me. And I'll just be talking. How's everybody doing tonight? Thank you for joining. And of course, you'll be able to view this video anytime, uh, both on my page and on the 5 o'clock history page. And again, I just want to remind you, so please check out the podcast. It's really good. It's about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. It's entertaining, and it's full of nuggets of information, like Claire put it. It's full of nuggets of information, and it's just, I just try to make it as funny as possible. It's for the ADD generation. Check it out, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and any other place where you can get your podcasts. So, any questions, comments, death threats, marriage proposals? 
All right. All right. Well, if there is none, I'm going to shut this down for the night. I hope everybody enjoyed this. I'm going to do another one probably within the next couple of weeks. And hopefully you will join me for that one too. I don't know what the subject is going to be. Yes. It's just like a party, isn't it? She forgot her question. So hopefully, you know, we will come up with a with a topic that we, we can really dig into. Uh probably next week the podcast will thank you very much. The podcast will probably uh take on some American history. I've been very, very Louisiana history um heavy. And there's a lot, a lot of stories you can tell about Louisiana history, but Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it's a lot of Louisiana history that I could cover, but there's a lot of stories in American history that I can cover as well. World history. I've been wanting to tell the story of Henry VIII, the man who was so horny, and because of COVID, I'm sure we all know what that's like. The man was so horny for Anne Boleyn, he started his own church. How's that for a story? I had too much wine. So, everybody, I appreciate you joining me. Uh, Cindy might be my my uh, historical my uh, history researcher. Okay, everybody. If there are no comments, okay. Yeah, it was crazy. I can just picture him with a chicken leg right now, just sitting there. So, if there are no comments, questions, marriage proposals, death threats, anything like that, we're going to shut it down for the night. Keep your eyes on the lookout for uh, 5 o'clock history, live chats just like this. And as always, on Monday, every Monday, check out 5 o'clock history, uh, the 5 o'clock history podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and any other place where you can find your podcast. And if you want to donate, you're not required to donate. But if you want to donate a couple of dollars, you know, so brother could, you know, upgrade the audio equipment to keep bringing you all the good stories or whatever, you know, I'll leave my Cash App or Venmo or whatever. But you're not required to donate. I appreciate if you do, but, you know, because I know times are hard for, for everybody. But anyway, I just want to tell y'all good night. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed this. Good night.